Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Down Over. I am joined today by my good friend Jeff Blanchard coming to us from the land down under. Melbourne, Australia. Jeff, how are you today? Good, thank you, Rick. All raring to go. So my new studio setup. Yeah, he's going to give us a little tour of what he's done. It's kind of cool. And joining us in the house, we've got Harold Muliati. He's also going to be co-hosting today. So here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And joining us today, here he is in that center position of total accountability. It's Harold. How are you doing, Harold? Pretty good. And yes, I can confirm, I am Harold. He is Harold. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, anyway, today we almost had Jay Christina on. He, I think he wanted to come on. He said he'd get back to me once he checked in with the studio, but I never heard back from him, so I guess he couldn't make it. It is, it is probably near dinner time where he is, so he couldn't make it. Jay's a great guy, and we look forward to seeing him on the next go round. Um, <clears throat> he's got a great podcast, and you know he's been talking a lot this week about the cameras and camera sales and how they are dying in the industry. I mean, really dying. Um, did we talk last week about this or no, maybe earlier this week? Okay. Uh, Sony, he went back and, and he had a, a report that Sony put out, sales from about 10, 2010 to now. And every two years, they drop by half. They started at 24 million sales per year of cameras, 24 million cameras or cameras sold per year, 24 million. Then it dropped to about 12 million the following two years. Two years after that, it was at 6 million. And last year, it was at about 3.6 million. That's an enormous amount of drop, and that's only Sony. And, and they're predicting this year, it may go down to 500,000, maybe at most a million or two. It's been that bad. Camera sales are dying. Same with Canon, not as bad, but they're dropping too. Uh, everyone's dropping. Uh, I don't know if you heard the news, but um, Olympus is giving up the uh, camera business. As of oh, June good. 30th, they will no longer be making or selling. They'll probably sell old inventory, but they won't be making or selling cameras anymore or lenses for those prosum consumer and prosumer line cameras. They're not making money on cameras. They're losing their shirts. And they made a big mistake. You know, the last thing they invested heavily on was that three or thirty-three thousand or thirty-two hundred dollar brick. It's a really nice looking camera. It's a but it's Micro Four Thirds, and as good as Micro Four Thirds is, if you're going to spend that much money, why not just buy a full frame? Mm. And that's that's what killed Olympus. The, their last thing they spent their wad on was, unfortunately, that beast of a camera, which didn't make it. You know, it was it was a sad move. Uh, they make great lenses. They have really good lenses. But again, Micro Four Thirds is competing very heavily right now with f full frame cameras that were twice as expensive before and now have gone down to Micro Four Thirds levels. So it makes for well, a it, tough. Yeah, it's quite sad because one my one my first camera back in the, the you know late sixties was a little Kodak one, just a. Mm -hmm. the and shoot and then my first proper camera was in in the early 70s was uh, an olympus trip 35 mm, which mm -hmm. i'm sure anybody who's been around for will know them that's such a stable I've, i i i didn't i don't still have it. i gave it to a friend who collects cameras but it's still here and that was a film camera right film camera yeah. but i thought they've been around so long but i think rick though like you're saying with the demise of sort of camera sales it's it's a bit like uh, I think, like the video libraries. You know, it's everybody's getting it. It's all and all, but it gets to a stage where mm -hmm. something new. Well, well, even in cameras, there's there's nothing that great and new. So what can they do? We still take pictures. It still is the skill of the person behind the camera yes. that makes a bigger difference in the camera. And so it's starting to plateau out. Whereas everybody's got a great camera. 
Mm -hmm. It's not like we used to have if you, you, oh, I've got the cheapest one I can afford, but the other one does a much better quality. But like you see these things, the iPhone and the and the Android phones, it take the picture quality is okay. It's still just how you frame the picture, but sometimes mm-hmm. you might, couldn't tell. Oh, that that's it's, oh, gee, that's a fantastic picture, and yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of the top pictures that are out there in in media these days, and it turns out that'll be on iPhones or some not on these big uh, five thousand dollar cameras or. Uh, or the ones that uh, you know uh, that's failing a little bit, but then again, everybody's got one. Whereas years mm-hmm. ago, it was the Olympus, Canon, and and who else would be around about Nikon? Them? Nikon, Nikon, but the, that would be about it. Yeah, so there weren't know, too many. Know, I mean, you had Pentax. Were, I don't know; they were there. I Pentax, think well, yeah, Pentax were there, but uh, um, they said uh, but Sigma was always there in the in the in, in the lenses. Account. Yep. What about they, Minolta? They, were they there? Yes, I think so. Yeah, and they disappeared. I mean, Pentax, and I think Pentax is still out there, sort of. Um, there were some other smaller brands, but oh, Fuji. I think Fuji was out there. But just to say, there were still all of the main things. Uh, with, but there were, and back then there still wasn't. There wasn't that many people using them either, no. because I mean, back in the seventies, oh, you've got a camera, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then people. They would take it wasn't it was so unusual for people to have cameras not everybody because no it wasn't the price of the camera it was the 35 dollars or 40 dollars to to I produce know. 20 pictures and and then have yeah. them printed out and, and you and you had no ch- no chance to really learn or not make mistakes from it unless you had a lot of money because film you had you had a 24 frame roll that's it and and now with with digital you can shoot 2400 frames or 2400 shots and eh, messed them all up i'll delete them and do them again and yes yeah, so- and, and so now anybody can do it whereas before you had to be very judicious in how you you took those pictures and then lousy picture takers like there were many like my mom they would just take 24 of the same thing and you go mm. what did you just do you just took 24 of the same picture i did yeah you did oh and they wasted the film and and you just go, oh. And so, yeah, I'm glad we're digital. I don't miss film at all. I know some people go, but film was so great. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah go buy some I, film. You can still must, get film. I must admit, though, uh, I still think my picture quality was much better in film, not because of the, uh, the, the because it was film. It's because I thought more about it. With, like you said, digital, mm-hmm. you don't care. And so you do do 10, 15 shots, you might mm-hmm. get one. Before you just you just paid attention to the settings yeah. a bit better film because you thought if I get this wrong it's a dollar or something mm. like that pretty much a, a shot whereas digital you don't so you do get a bit lazy and like like what do they say spray shooting is it mm-hmm. so, brrr, mm-hmm. so I've taken ten thousand shots I'm I'm <laughs> bound to get one good one yeah but it's nearly always the best shot is always the one that somebody's sat there for three hours waiting to get it <laughs> still yeah I just that patience. <laughs> my, my thoughts sort of with the digital, Your mic's not on Harold. Your, Your mic's, mic's not, not on Harold. <laughs> my thoughts with the digital and, and as far as new camera sales go is I wonder if part of it could be that the way that w- with the speed of uh with the speed at which digital camera technology has advanced, has it got to a point where people haven't quite caught up to the point where they really need the new uh, innovations? Because I'm thinking of, for example, for example, things like uh, you know Darren Miles rebuying a D750. Mm-hmm. Maybe a lot of the cameras have already gotten to the point where it's meeting a lot of people's needs, and that doesn't mean it's going to meet everyone's needs. Maybe high-end art photographers, high-end product f- photographers, they can use further improvements in you know full frame and even medium format ca- cameras and that sort of thing. Yeah, and in defense of Darren, I had the, the Nikon D750, and that I would honestly say mm-hmm. that was one of the best cameras I ever had and sold. And, and I sold it not because I didn't like it, I didn't want to have three lines of different cameras. I go, it's too much. So I decided I'm staying with Canon and with with Panasonic, for example. I didn't need an extra line with extra lenses and more costs. And 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 the Nikon D750 for me was good for photos, but the video I didn't think was that good. It, it didn't have all the functionality and features of even the GH5. 
So I said, well, I don't really want to go into that line, but I tell you, as a picture camera with the lenses, mm. with the lens combinations, the D750 is amazing. Oh, it's a beautiful, right. beautiful camera. But on that train of thought, it makes me wonder. New new camera sales have been plummeting for a lot of companies, but I wonder how used camera sales are doing. I wonder if those are have those gone down? Have they well, actually? Those, those always do well. Yeah. If you go to eBay, people buy cameras like crazy that are used. Definitely. Because again, it's like a car. If you buy a car, the minute you drive off the lot, your car is worth about fifty percent less just by driving mm. off the lot. All of a sudden, you've lost everything. It's not worth that much. So with a camera, it's almost the same. Once you buy it, you might get 75% back. You might only get 50% back. But the thing is, people like that. They like getting that maybe 25% off or 50% off. It's worth it to them, especially if the camera's not too, too old. Or if the camera's really old, they want those deals because they love some of those old cameras. Mm. Yeah. So it, it just depends. Um, and unlike a mode, unlike a motor car, you know the you're still using it every day. But a lot of these secondhand cameras have been bought, they're stuck into a cupboard, and they <coughs> haven't seen the light of day for three years, and they're pretty much like the wear brand new. They're just not being yeah. used, or they might have had, you know, might have had a thousand pictures taken, which is nothing. <laughs> well, that, so. yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess we know. You know, all three of us take good, get good, careful get care of our gear. However, there may be some people that they buy a camera new, and as soon as they take it out of the box, they put a wad of chewing gum in the oh. memory card slot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, some people really do treat their cameras badly. You know, it's uh, we've had some people that touch cameras, and I take it. You know what? You don't do that to a camera, and they're like, "Oh, sorry." Uh, tripods. I, one person broke a tripod working with us. I was like, you know, how do you break this? You got to really treat it badly. Um, and fortunately, I think it was a bad design, and we took it back to Sammy's, and they replaced it with it. With I actually paid more. They took it back, and and I, I spent three hundred more and got a better Manfrotto. But the thing is, you know, it, people really treat their gear with no respect. And, and you know, you've seen it. People who rent cars treat the rental cars like crap, and you just go. Didn't anybody teach you some consideration for others, some respect? Maybe it's not your property. Be nicer to it. But no, I'm actually I'm actually the other way around. Is that, you know, I do take care of my stuff. Yeah. But if it's somebody else's, I treat it like gold. A bit of, yeah. Because it's not mine. I, I, yeah. Like if it's mine, I'd look after it. But if it gets damaged, that's my problem. But if I'm renting a car or doing borrowing somebody else's, I'm extra special because it's not mine, not mine to damage. So. Yeah. Uh, I, hey, Jeff. Speaking of your stuff, are you going to give us the Blanchard Studio tour? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I, I will do. I just don't know how what the quality of these pictures. I I did the pictures, but I thought uh, I thought they were higher quality. But I think when I just downloaded them from. Um, uh, what's it lightroom i just did them too small but hang on well i've got my new studio well here's i don't know here's here's a picture of the old studio i don't know it might be a bit blurry i just don't know whether it's coming through clear or whether it's uh, my transmission looking here there's the old studio over there which uh you know different ones there here there's one at the side with all the cables and that you see in the corner i had me me sound booth and all that mm -hmm. there pretty messy and the dog thing in the corner of course on that yeah, the, uh, that that's still me old one there, all cluttered in there. And then look at that. Look at all those lovely cables. <laughs> and I, I, I just I don't know why I don't get uh, elect, didn't get electrocuted or whatever. <laughs> so I went crazy, ripped out everything, and then bought a new desk. And so you know, put the I didn't do a, a putting together video because I thought I don't want people to see me struggling for three hours or whatever. <laughs> but I must admit. This is up from upstanddesk.com.au. It was the easiest thing I've ever put together, and I thought, you know, usually you have these little things mm -hmm. from Ikea or something that takes you four hours, a little mm -hmm. bookshelf. Yeah. This didn't take long at all because with all the, the, the legs I had to put on, on it and that, and you can see with all the, the legs up, all the mechanical legs I had to put on there. Yeah, it's a beautiful-looking desk, too. Yeah, up, and down the, desk. The, the, and it's the uh, bamboo... Uh, bamboo wood and like mm -hmm. I said it's two pieces but the dad you said you can't get two exactly the same so they are two different colors you see because they said the the wood's different in each panel that you interesting. get interesting right yeah. that's on that but it's a it is a lovely desk on that one there 
Uh, now that's that extended to my standing position where I am now. And one of the biggest challenges was, well, I've got to make sure all the cables are done in a way so that when I do stand up, they're not all pulling out of the, the power socket. So, and that's another angle. See, so I'm stood at, that's another now, angle if it's stood up there. Ha have you added more, uh, more sound treatment than before? It looked like you had more panels now. No, no, no. It's all the same. All the same okay. thing. I might need to do a bit more. I'm not too sure. But now, this is the desk where, uh, and the one to the left, to the left of the, the that one. That's the one I'm looking in now. Looking straight with, I have yeah. put a camera. That that's where I'm looking in it now. And then the iMac at the at the, at the right. And then the other two with my work work screen So when I'm working from home, because now we're doing it a lot more, I to set it up for that. And then uh, from the other end, this is from behind it there. And now I'll put the green screen on the sound treatment as well. So, <laughs> and you can see the camera there that's there and the, the NTG2 microphone there and my monitor speakers, my Yamaha monitor speakers there as well. And that's I'll, your camera there on the right side or? On the right, yep, that's it. Yeah. On, on the right side, on the top of the monitor there. And then all the last thing I've got to do is just the, this is underneath it. I've just got to get through a couple of one, uh, cables done up because all these ones dangling are from the actual lights. I just had to see where the lights fit uh, and whether they were doing a good job. And I've just got the lights uh, right now, so uh, uh, I can get rid of the last few cables. But I'm really happy with that. And as I said, it's got plenty of room. And I'm just uh, just don't with well, one of the things Rick was talking about. We might be talking about now is voiceovers. I'm trying to see how I, if I can do my voiceovers here, if it make the sound, because I did have them in the bit further back in the corner. And one of the things I've got done on here is, with the desk being so long, it protrudes a bit into the back of the, the shot here, mm -hmm. over, over this shoulder, where you can't see it. But if I do this, you can, you can, see, you can see the desk. Oh, yeah. It's very funny in the green screen. So I've got a green bit of green oh you've got you've got some green, green stuff panel. covering the table yeah. there i see uh -huh. <laughs> i can do this as well i can do that <laughs> no, do that so we well, so, know jeff so just got... listening to listening to you talk on the mic i think your studio i don't think probably needs any more sound dampening it sounds clean yeah so. no i don't think so too but uh, i'm thinking i'm trying to see if i can do some the recording from here because now why i did it at the back before because i was stood up and the desk was down, but now I can stand up. Mm -hmm. I want to do it here because <laughs> voiceovers, it's great to sit down when you've got a lot to do, but it still yeah. can't, you can't move your arms and you can't, you don't breathe properly when you're all bent down. Some people are comfortable with it and it depends what you're doing, but I like to do uh, stand up when you're doing it. And then you, so there's a matter of urgency as well. And then you don't mess around, you're just a bit more. Uh, you, determined on what to do rather than when you sat down now you know that's cool that's a great new studio now i wanted to tell you we have we're going to create a product that's coming out soon you know with all the social distancing requirements everybody has to stay apart it's really been bad on sex people are having a real hard time you know having any kind of sex with social distancing so harold and i were talking today and we're going to develop the x well the s xlr cable Okay. S XLR cable, the sex LR cable. Okay. And it's going to be six feet long and it'll help connect two people together in one way or another, however they want. Uh, it'll be very cheap. It won't cost very much at all. And it'll be approved by governments around the world. The sex LR cable for social distancing. Alternatively, the XXX LR cable. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and that's called extra, extra long range. Yeah. And that's going to connect people together. Isn't connect it? people together, yes. So they can be more intimate in times of high stress. Mm. Yes, well, um, I mean, it's prob probably good. It's always been a good excuse with this, uh, with the uh, isolation to not have to visit people that you don't want to sometimes. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> but, but as I said, I'm not, not a terribly social person anyway, so I don't think I've noticed that much difference uh, on this, but... Uh, 
I do must, must admit I do miss going out and having the occasional meal. That's, That's what I about. miss. I miss going out to restaurants or going to a mall and walking around, going to any park or beach without yeah. idiotic restrictions. And I refuse to wear a mask, not for any political reason. One, they don't do anything. So why wear something that's going to make you not feel well? They're, they're finding out more and more you're going to get secondary and tertiary bacterial infections from masks. Masks. masks can't talk today. Uh, you're going to get other issues like uh, hypoxia with certain kind of masks where your organs aren't getting enough oxygen. They start shutting down. It's stupid. And, and by the way, people don't transmit it. It's not airborne unless somebody spits on you. And even then... They came out yesterday and said it's very hard to even get this from touch. Like if you touch a surface. Right? So why are we doing all this? It's too hard. And, and by the way, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and Dr. Fauci, the illustrious imp, you know, he even said don't wear masks. So they're saying it because I think they're afraid of getting killed by people because you don't need it. And of course, half the people are terrified, so they're wearing it now whether they need it or not. So anyway... Yeah, that's the joy of our living in the the new world order. Like this, this is the new world order. This is what it's going to be like. Well, you can keep it. I, I think it's stupid. But anyway, we were talking about voiceover earlier, and one of the things about voiceover, there's different ways to read things. You know, one of them is, you can hear, and here's something to do: if you're at home, try doing this. Get a song, the lyrics of a song that you mm -hmm. like, that you know. And just start reading it out loud, but put some acting in it. For, for example, let's see if I remember the lyrics. Uh, this is a Bee Gees song. Um, what's it called? You know, uh, to love somebody. To love somebody. Okay. And it starts out, there's a light, a certain kind of light, a light that doesn't shine on me. I want my love to be lived with you. Lived with you. There's a way, a certain kind of way, to do each and every little thing. But what good does it bring if I don't have you? I don't have you. You don't know what it's like to love somebody. You don't know what it's like to love somebody the way I love you. So you take the song and you try to put a little drama into it. You're not singing it because you could sing it. And even then you'd have to emote a little bit. But in this case, you're reading something. And I say songs because most people remember lyrics to some songs. It's a good starting point. Harold and I were practicing a little bit some lyrics from, um, oh, it's that ending poem on Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues. And there's a place where he says, Cold-hearted orb that rules the night, the night. So we were trying. The Harold, do you want to try that? So we can say, cold-hearted orb that rules the night. Cold-hearted orb that rules the night. Jeff, do you want to try that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm back>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so cold-hearted orb that rules the night. The night. So you get almost scuttled. Harold, Harold was sounding a bit like Rod Serling then when he... Rod <laughs> Serling. Yeah, that's good. Try it again, Harold. Cold and relax, hearted you, orb relax that, yourself a bit. Sure. Cold-hearted orb that rules the night. The night. The, the night. night. <laughs> and then if you want to get a little more dramatic, cold-hearted orb that rules the night. The night. So you're playing with your voice. You're playing with your head voice, your, your throat voice, and, and more your chest voice. So as you go lower and slower, the night, you're bringing it down. You have the emotion. First of all, it's cold-hearted orb, the moon. Cold-hearted orb that rules the night. Because the night scares people. The cold-hearted orb, it's cold. It doesn't have emotion. And then you get to the night, and you bring your voice down. You can even snarl the night. The thing is, you're creating an emotion with your voice, with the way you do things. So we were working on, you know, how to do things. Like, for example, Harold, count one, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. So he's playing with working the voice up, down. You can say one, two, 
three, four, and five. Try that one. One, two, three, four, and five. Now three was still pretty high. Three, four, and five. We go really low on four and five. Three, four, and five. Can you feel it in your chest? Just a tad. A tad. I, I definitely need to practice that and get because. Uh, Rick and I were talking uh, earlier in the week, and I, you know, I noticed a lot too. Where my voice tends to, especially when I'm not paying attention, it, it keeps going higher and higher, and it gets kind of, you know, like a balloon going up and getting the little guy voice. <laughs> we call that the nut clip. <laughs> <laughs> but that always happens, like it does with me. It's like everybody. If that starts to happen, just slow, slow down. Slow down. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so it, and it, it's, it's, you can hear everybody starts getting pretty down. I go, blah, 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 and you get higher and higher. Yep. The slower and, and, you know, and you can't control that. Once you go high, uh, it's really hard to come out with a low voice. Yeah. It's almost impossible. Because the Very frequency high. of your vocal cords is, is moving up. And if you're trying to go low, if you're trying to go low when you talk really fast, you know it's getting higher anyway. No matter what you do, it's going to get a little bit higher. And you strain. Then you'll start straining your vocal cords and your chest because you're trying to bring it down when your cords are frequencing up. So those are things to consider. Our vocal cords vibrate. And it vibrates sound against your palate, in your mouth. We hear it through the, um, oh, what you call it? the jawbone, the, the maxillary area, and it vibrates. So we hear very differently from what it sounds like when it's on on your microphone or when it, on the recording. So sometimes we think our voice is low, but it's not. We, we, we may think we're low because we're hearing maybe in our headset something that sounds boomier, but then we don't talk it that way. So part of that is learning how to slow down. The minute you slow down, all of a sudden you can talk more from your upper chest which is more the diaphragm kind of voice, and you can bring it up. That's what singers do. They bring it up from from here. You talk over here normally, usually, where you're talking more from your throat. And then, of course, if you start talking really fast, hey, everybody, you want to go to the new show? Come on, see the new show. It's on at 10 o'clock Friday nights. And you go high. You can't help it. If you start mm. speeding it up, you notice it's very hard to find a guy who talks with a really low voice who can go that fast. They don't. Well, I always remember one of the uh, what's the the best paying job in voiceover that's I think that's ever got is uh, James L. Jones mm. has uh, got he got one million dollars for saying <laughs> NBC. <laughs> so now they got he got a million like dollars that. for that, really? Yeah, he, yeah wow. he got him for saying NBC, NBC or CBS. <clears throat> I forget. Which one. Well, yeah, they, but it was one was, and he just said that's yeah. all he said. He got paid a million dollars for. That. I remember that. I can't remember which channel it was, but you're right. NBC. Yeah, NBC that's amazing. CBS and nothing. Yeah. But he got such that he's got the only one with that deep voice that, because of yeah. Star Wars, everybody mm -hmm. knows that voice and just yes. think oh, it just sounds so nice and just those you know, a couple of letters and you think <laughs> just to say that and you can imagine Isn't it amazing. Yeah. Well, do you, there was this guy, John LaFontaine, very famous voiceover talent, who, who he never thought of himself all that special or popular or anything else. He died young, too. I think he was in his 60s. Uh, but John LaFontaine was the, in a world long ago, in a, la in a time, a land that time forgot. He had that deep voice. And he did 5,000 movie trailers. I was going to say, he's a bit like, uh, from the Warner Brothers, the Mel Blanc. Mm, the Mel yes. Blanc. All every uh, Warner Brothers cartoon, Bugs yeah. Bunny, Daffy, yeah. every character in there was Mel Blanc. But yeah. it's a bit like uh, that, that. The other fellow. Every movie you heard back in the day was. was mm -hmm. And I think Mel Blanc did something like eighty voices. Not Mel. Uh, what's it? Mel, yeah, yeah. Mel he Blanc. Did, he did, yeah. yeah I, I don't think there was anything. And when he died. That's when all the cartoons died, really, because then they had Bugs Bunny, yeah, well, and it just wasn't the right one. No. you could tell <laughs> he was it's amazing. A bit like, no, I think no. it's a bit like when Frank Oz, when Frank Oz eventually leaves leaves this world, you, like who's the voice of Yoda? But all the Muppets mm. will be gone because he was, <laughs> yep. there. and like like when Jim Henson died, yeah, you couldn't have uh, Kermit the Frog anymore. People tried, but it just sounded like somebody trying to be Kermit. 
Oh, he did Henson do his one. voice? Yeah, Jim Henson did did came at the frog and the few, but, the, okay. but then Jim Henson, you you just looked at him and he talked normally, and you just said, "That's came at the frog." I don't think he was putting the voice on. <laughs> it just sounded like well, yeah. it came at the frog normally. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Well, you know, here's one of our voiceover talents that we use a lot at work in our professional projects is Matt Baker. Matt Baker is a great voiceover talent. He's got a really good voice. He speaks fast when he wants to, but he can also go more slowly. He doesn't have a deep, deep voice, but he's got a perfect voice. It's just really good for the kind of work that he does. He does a ton of stuff on, on Discovery Channels, the History Channel, does a lot of programs on those where he's the narrator or he does i've, I've heard him in in sales narrations i've heard him all over the place yeah, he does a lot the of discovery e-learning. channel i think he tends to do the shark week right yeah i think so yeah um now he has character names for his voices uh i forgot what they are now but like alfred and homer one of them was seymour seymour yeah you know we we actually interviewed him where he talked about this so we'll we'll link that below and he, yeah yeah Matt is a great guy. If you ever need voiceover, he's amazing. He he really reads perfectly. He's fast, good turnaround time. He's got his own studio where he walks into at home. And but but Matt creates the names of voices. So one, he practices those kinds of voices. Like he's got his oh, what is it? Something like, Hi oh, everyone, welcome to the course. Here we're gonna learn about this, this, and this. Click next to continue. That's Seymour, his his typical e learning voice. Then he's got another e-learning voice, which is a little more engaging. Then he has his sales voice, and he's got this voice and that voice. And they all have names, and he practices those voices mm. all the time so that when he goes into character, he is in that voice's character. And it's a good mm. technique to have. Like, yeah, If you're doing voiceover for, for e-learning, for example, create that voiceover voice, the voice you think people want to hear. You could vary it a little bit, do other things with it. But if you create your voice the way you want it, you give it a name, and that kind of triggers your brain to go into that voice. And then you can repeat that often without any issue. Because a lot of times when people, impressively in the beginning, when they start out, they, they're not sure what their voice is. They have a good voice, maybe. But then they start going up. Um, Hi, everyone. Welcome to the course. Uh, Today, we're going to learn about this. And of course, you're also going to learn about that. But first, let's take a look at what that is. And they go up and down and they're trying to figure out who they are. And you go, no, 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 don't do that. Try to focus on a tone, have some variation within the tone, but keep it natural. Natural is very important. If you sound fake or too pretentious or too this or too that, people either get turned off or they like it. But a lot of times it's usually a turn off. If there's too much um, accentuation on, on what you're saying, they might go, hmm, or, or anything else. You've got to watch the non-natural. So you can have a great voice, but if it sounds very contrived, people won't like it. If it sounds natural, there's a good chance people will feel more comfortable with it because they'll feel you're more like them in some way or other, or you're not imposing, because there's always that imposing part of being in, in doing a voice. I think the easiest way to uh, associate it with something everybody knows about it, just imagine when you, you take a picture of somebody and they smile. Hmm. How many people, when they, they're, they're forcing a smile, you can tell how horrible it looks, mm-hmm. but when somebody's got a natural smile, it, it, it shows it's really nice. It's yeah. the same thing with voiceover. You can be nice and excited, but if it's put on, it just sounds like it's so silly. It sounds like it's put on. That, that's where the true artists that, that's out there that do great jobs that you think it's somebody that, that it, they are really excited about it. They're not just putting on a voice for that. And that's a real art, like you said, that Matt's got. It's You just don't think it's somebody putting on a voice. You just think it's some that Seymour who's so excited doing this course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it's natural. You don't think, oh, that's how he really sounds. Now, when you get someone who's reading and pronounce, over-pronouncing the words or trying really, really, really hard to be perfect, people usually get turned off because that person doesn't sound natural. And mm. you, you don't you remember your learners or your audience is perceiving your voice and they'll either like it or they won't. 
And, and that's why when you hear somebody like a, like a Bill Gates talk, you just kind of go, ooh, what an ugly voice. It's uh, Maybe it comes from his personality, sort of ugly. I don't know. <laughs> but the voice comes across as, well, you have no choice. You have to do this. Ah! <clears throat> and you just well, well, go, ah. It's a bit, a bit back in uh, in the eighties with the uh, what's it? Well, it was well, eighties. Margaret Thatcher when she came oh, onto yeah. the, mm-hmm. the scene, she she didn't have she had peculiar hair. She had peculiar mm-hmm. teeth, fixed up her teeth, and and said, "No, well, you've got to talk properly." And then yep. she became so demanding, and and that mm-hmm. and like we had a thing here with a sixty minutes reporter interviewed, uh, and somebody said. Uh, some people are saying that you are, uh, you know, evil or to say, <laughs> people. Tell me, I want their names. <laughs> but, <laughs> she, she, but she, she, he was frightened to death of her. But as I thought, but it was the way <laughs> that it wasn't her, but she was taught to use her voice. Yes, and and that was and that was her biggest thing is just how, like I said, it was a woman there sat, but it was just the voice that yep. really did. Well, you know, you've just. And, and that just reminds me of because uh, earlier earlier today, Rick and I were talking about how when you have intention, when you have mm. when you have the uh, willpower and energy behind your voice, you can really command people. You can really get their attention. And then that's that's what it is. people think voiceover is just to record things for mm. that, but it's, it's a life <clears throat> skill. They yeah. said if you say things clearly and. <clears throat> clear you can demand things better <laughs> and you know without being nasty that no no just, and, and then there's cl- and, well, and for example police the police always get taught how to use a command and control voice because they have to they you know, they can't walk into saying excuse me excuse me can can you stop hitting each other yeah. it doesn't work <laughs> that way you walk in and go stop Whoop. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're all looking around what happened stop it now move out and and you change your voice and i've known a lot of people for example most people don't know i teach martial arts but when i teach martial arts i'm very different from when i'm normal i can go into very much command and control voice and you start belting out commands and and people are like oh oh but that's because you're trying to get people into a certain mindset you're trying to get them into the moment rather than la, 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 la. you have to live that moment but you're right. There's a lot of uses for our voice, whether you're you're talking, selling, whatever else. You know, they say like the first ten or fifteen seconds when you meet somebody is is the immediate impression. Do you like that person or not? It doesn't take long. Like, you know, I mean, Jeff, you and I, when we first met, it was at that hotel, the the Hilton Hotel in Orlando. Orlando, that's correct. And I think Jeff came behind me, and goes, Rick, Jeff, and, and it was like, oh, it was like old friends. We knew each other forever. And, but that doesn't always happen, you know. But when you meet somebody, within seconds, you know. Mm. Or, or if you meet somebody and go, oh, I don't really like this person. Mm. And you're more cautious, usually. When you meet somebody you don't care for, you're like, mm. uh, But that's, you know, the voice has a lot to do with that, too. How people talk, their emotions. And so, you know, it's amazing that during school, nobody ever teaches you anything about your voice. No. Nothing. Nothing. No. And, it's, it's and that's the, the thing it's it's actually something that's really important for you know furthering your career for meeting people and, and yeah. making a good impression on them but yeah no one really teaches you <laughs> oh but we don't we don't talk anymore these days we just look at the uh, look at a mobile phone and just tap on it don't we? yeah that's true I think we're going to evolve without vocal cords you know in generations to come because people won't be talking so <laughs> Yeah, just, this is the year 2525, if man is still alive. <laughs> I, it still amazes me how pe- many people are, w- we walk along the street and you can't see their face because it's always down looking at the phone. And I thought, oh, I know. So millions killed every day but because they walk across roads don't look and they're just they're just walking yeah. looking at the phones and that's all, all that. they're doing 24 7 they go to bed with their phones in their hands unlike when we're walking just say hello when you go uh, mm-hmm. morning and then now if you do that i do that on purpose sometimes because people think you're strange good morning <laughs> and you can, oh! ah! <laughs> he talked and, and like now even now you say good morning and so oh 
Don't talk. You're a <laughs> hater. Hater. Yeah. You talk to me. Uh, I'm, 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 I am 10, 10, 20 feet away near enough. I'm just saying good morning. And I thought yeah. that's just the natural thing to do. But uh, it's the thing is if you don't use your voice, it sort of it, it, it just goes away. It I does. Know, uh, saying so, uh, to somebody else, my, my elderly mother, when she was at, uh, at home on her own all day, and then it'd come to see her at night. She wasn't speaking very well because she hadn't spoken mm -hmm. all day. But mm -hmm. now she's in, in care with she talks to every. She talks much better and, and much easier to understand than she did before mm -hmm. because she was losing the, the the talking because she didn't have anybody to speak to. Yeah, it's but interesting. It's <clears throat> and that's where voiceover. You've still got to do practice. If you haven't got anything to do, just grab a newspaper and yeah. read it and record it and There's have fun with it. One of the things I like playing around with is like any of the, uh, to have a bit of practice, is any of the, the rock operas or anything like Jesus mm. Christ. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of, of vocal areas in that because a lot of the music, the, the singing things are, can be done as a, as a script. And that and one of my favorite ones is War of the Worlds as well. That's a mm. good one. That's got yep. a lot of uh, good ones that you can have a play with. And like you said before, because it's a, it's got music and songs that you know. You know the words. You don't have to read really You know them, but you can put your own expressions into mm -hmm. into. Yeah, and it makes a, a real big difference. But one of yeah, the things, though, one of your warm up things, if you go, if you can sing a song or all that, that gets mm -hmm. you into that <coughs> vocal cord doing that. And and you, but when you're just saying normal words, it's you feel a bit funny just having a practice opening and closing yeah. your mouth. Yep. and like vibrating your lips and that and moving your tongue so you know putting your tongue at the back and just mm -hmm. and vibrating yeah. your teeth all that just makes a big difference but you just yep. don't realize it until you start recording a few things that's true and with that we are out of time we've had a long show today i think we started early too focus here the camera keeps going out of focus i think there, yep, there it goes there you go <laughs> anyway what well, we hope you practice some of your voiceover practice 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 even if you're not planning on being a voice talent or anything else it'll help you with other things in life even when you go to mcdonald's to place an order for food you'll sound clearly and they'll love you you well, still get I'm, the same I'm, crummy I'm, food what, but they'll love you before we left one of my first trips to america with one of my friends and he did that and he, eh, eh, because he, we wanted to hire a cat so we got on <laughs> excuse me can i please i want to know i want to hire a cat and i want to want something other two things excuse me sir what <laughs> what i'm sorry i don't understand and, and i just got on the phone and, you know and you had to just say precisely what what he was saying excuse because he said excuse me could i please have i want to do the all irrelevant <laughs> babbling and as mm -hmm. i said yeah. if you, and then he said, I would like to hire a car. Oh, certainly, sir. <laughs> What's yep. happening? Yeah. Okay. Well, when, uh, when do you want it? Now. Oh, certainly, sir. <laughs> and he, uh, it took me about five minutes, but he had to do things like that. And that's another thing. You don't have, yes, you might say, Ex yeah, please, can I hire a car? You, but you don't go into all the, uh, be clear yep. and precise. And yep. that's always a good example. It's a good start. <laughs> yep. Well, anyway, everyone, have a good one. We will see you, I think, not next week. I think we don't have a show next week, but the week after we'll be right back. So have a good one, everyone, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.